Good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Well, the gang's all here. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get started since it's uh, 401 and I know we have a lot to talk about. We're, we're in no way going to cover it all. It's uh, I think it'll be a fun discussion and a, a fast paced one. Uh, the idea here is a round table hitting on some of our favorite year end tax planning topics. And there's a lot of potential strategies. Um, so uh, a few disclaimers up front. First of all, <clears throat> wanted to get out is I have some type of uh, chest cold or something and Kevin and Derek have been struggling with me all day long in meetings, so I apologize <laughs> if I'm, you know, uh, clearing, clearing my throat like that. I don't know what's going on. I feel fine, but like creeps up and just clamps my throat. So I apologize uh, <clears throat> for you all uh, having to sit through that. But that's the first disclaimer. The other one is uh, obviously that uh, uh, this is just a general discussion of thoughts. Do not take this as your own personalized advice for anyone who's listening, listening to a recast, uh, you know, a podcast, or any of this, you know, seek your own professional advice. And uh, we will uh, try and throw in disclaimers where we where we need to and we have them, but uh, it's going to be a general overview. So without taking too much time, uh, some introductions. Very happy to have Mark Gastner joining us. Mark is a CPA and certified financial planner with Ellingson & Ellingson, tax firm in Edina or St. Louis Park? Edina. Edina. Yep. Edina, Minnesota. Uh, Mark's a very sharp guy. We have a few mutual clients that we've worked on and, and definitely have uh, professional respect, but we are completely separate entities. There is no uh, connection between us and you know the views are, are independent in our own. So very happy to have Mark with his uh, tax expertise joining us. Kevin O'Loughlin, uh, very sharp certified financial planner here with us at Cahill Financial Advisors. And uh, uh, many clients will be familiar with Kevin and excited to get him out here in the public eye to uh, share some of his knowledge and strategies. And then uh, Derek Kicho is newer to our team, also a certified financial planner. Derek has a great background in banking, and finance, uh, financial advisory work. He's a certified financial planner. And uh, and uh, so I've asked everyone to join us here since of me just droning on the whole time so we can kind of go through and, and share some of our top, top tips here. So <laughs> with all that said, this time of year, Kevin, you and I, for many years, we get into the fourth quarter and we are uh, doing a number of things portfolio related, specifically for clients and think about portfolios and what are some things you're looking at? What are things to, to share there? Well, you, you know, right off the top, it, one of our mantras, and I think, you know, Scott, we, we probably connected on this early on, is that you don't want to let the tax tail wag the dog. And while portfolio and financial planning are and tax are almost two sides to the same coin, you, you don't want to let that necessarily drive decisions. But with that said, uh, tax loss selling in particular a year like 2022 and let's you know uh, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, we hit all-time market highs going back to, say, January 1st of, of 2022. And it has been a rough year, both for uh, fixed income, which is a little bit new. We've talked with a lot of folks about that, but then also equities where, you know, we do know that there's going to be a pullback and uh, that happens with some degree of frequency, but um, it, it does present some opportunities. And while Silver lining is maybe a, a, a bit much from a tax loss selling standpoint. There are opportunities. And now we're not talking about your IRAs. We're not talking about 401k plans. We're not talking about Roth IRAs, any of those tax deferred or tax qualified accounts. But for, for folks that have taxable accounts, there is an opportunity where depressed values, even if it's temporary, can be sold. Uh, so securities positions can be sold and you can recognize a tax loss, which would offset any taxable gain. So where we see that come into play most frequently is, uh, you know, perhaps somebody that has uh, an embedded position, an inherited position, something that has a, a large gain that they really don't want as part of their portfolio, but have been hesitant or, you know, reluctant to actually sell and diversify because of that embedded gain. Well, realizing losses 
in other parts of the portfolio can offset that and actually make for a, a pretty seamless opportunity to, to get your po portfolio in line. So that's, that's one thing on the, the tax loss selling piece. Um, tax gain harvesting. That's something I think Mark's going to touch on here in a bit. So I'm going to let that, that move on to him. But we, we've also looked a little bit about uh, or a little bit at mutual fund distributions. And so with uh, some of the inherited portfolios we've seen over the years, there can be uh, different investments embedded in those portfolios where in a year like this, maybe the manager of a, a certain mutual fund has had uh, a really rough go of it. They've made some internal transactions and that has created the need to distribute gains or losses um, for, for their own rebalancing purposes. What that can mean though, is as an investor, you may own XYZ security that is down, pick a number, 20%, 30% if it was really growth oriented in a year like this, but that fund may be distributing a pretty significant capital gain. So you get hit twice, your position is down, and you're getting dinged with a big tax bill. And so uh, selling a position like that in advance of a tax distribution can be a huge win in avoiding that extra taxation, getting you into a spot where you can rebalance your portfolio. Um, and, you know, and then maybe the last piece is, generally speaking, um, asset location. So how do we be efficient with what asset lives in which account. And there are, you know, Scott, I, I'm going to steal your, your line here, but dirty assets. There are, there are dirty assets from a tax standpoint. And uh, you take, for example, uh, real estate or high yield bonds, anything that really kicks off a significant amount of taxable income year in and year out. They're important pieces of a diversified portfolio. So they need to be there, but where you hold them matters. And when you've got the opportunity to hold them away from a taxable account, that can be a really, really big advantage. And so as we go through tax loss selling, tax potentially tax gain selling, and some of these other pieces, we look to make sure we're optimizing that location optimization to keep those, those dirty, really high tax assets out of the accounts where they're going to hit your tax return. Yeah, that's great stuff. And uh, thanks for stealing the line. I think it sounds better when you say it than when I hear myself. But it, uh, and I think in so much of this, I mean, across the entire spectrum of financial planning, wealth strategies, there's a lot of interdependency. And even some of those points, I mean, you and I have sat there many times and noodled out, okay, someone has a legacy position in a mutual fund. Let's give them a big taxable distribution. We'd like to exit it, but oh, that's going to recognize capital gains and back and forth and the, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the combination of things. But um, yeah, excellent, uh, excellent recap. So, Mark, um, you are the expert when it actually comes to filing returns and submitting it and dealing with the IRS. Uh, maybe some thoughts on, on, on filing and those types of things. And, you know, maybe one thing if I could request, I'm curious, you know, we've talked about the idea of filling up tax brackets and Kevin talked about recognizing losses. You know, normally we think deduct and defer, deduct and defer, but when would we want to actually recognize gains? Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Good question on, in that regard. And um, like Kevin somewhat alluded to there is that there are times where it's considered tax gain harvesting. Um, all that means is that, so capital gains, long-term are taxed at a preferential tax treatment to those of interest income, those dirty assets that Kevin also talked about. And um, with long-term capital gains, they allow a 0% tax rate on federal up to 40,000, roughly speaking, if you're single, 80,000, roughly speaking, if you're filing jointly. Um, so there's a way that you could be in a position where you're at a lower income year this year for whatever other reason. And there really could be a, a, a low cost transaction of saying, okay, I have $10,000 of gain in this position. I could sell it today, recoup, have that gain hit at a 0% bracket, 
buy it instantaneously. You don't have to wait 30 days when it's a gain. And then you're still in the same position, but now we've reduced our exposure down the line of the unrealized gains. And so that's something we see um, here and there as a, a planning item here at year end to consider. And, and so. it's like one of the least talked about simplest, most powerful strategies. It's available mm -hmm. to a lot of people in the ability to essentially wash out the gain. I, I love it. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those depends on your situation. Um, you know, you have to weigh pros and cons, but especially if those are after employment, pre-required distributions out of their retirement accounts, um, it could be a great opportunity to consider that versus maybe some of the other items of Roth conversion. So you're balancing the pros and cons of all of that. Um, and then I know you mentioned two other pieces right now. Um, and one piece at fourth quarter that we're talking is estimated payments with clients and or, you know, you're just checking the pulse of your tax situation for 2022. Um, and with that, it's okay, how much income do I have? Am I projecting that I'm going to owe? And if that's the case, how do I pay the amounts owed? Now, just to point out, there's underpayment potential for penalties or underpayment penalties. And people may not be aware, but the rate they used to charge at the IRS level was 3%. It's based on inflation, so it's now adjusted to 6% on the underpayment of estimated tax. So we've doubled given the inflation situation that we've been in, and people may not be aware of that. So now you have to be more tactical. And when am I paying my estimated payments? The IRS gave itself a raise? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're not going to necessarily uh, <laughs> pay you on the overpayment, right, not necessarily right. amount, but they'll, they'll take it on your cut. So um, that's a piece to just keep in mind right now is that when you used to say, oh, it's free or it's cheap, wait till April, pay the taxes. It is a 6% rate now between now and April, if you were to wait, rather than if you're at the like safe harbor levels or protected from penalty levels. Very good, very good. Thanks, Mark. So Derek, I know we talked about, there's this whole array, a whole sort of a jumble of numbers and alphabet soup of special retirement plans provided for in the tax code, individual retirement accounts, a few different types, qualified retirement plans, big issue. A lot of our clients, that's where they've amassed the, the bulk of their wealth. Um, you know, what types of things are we looking at year end in regards to those plans? Yeah, I had, um, I had a little bit of a list uh, put together, so I'll try not to monopolize more time than, than necessary, but I think kind of on the qualified retirement plan front, and I'll keep things pretty simple, I'll primarily just be talking about 401k plans since I think that applies to, to most people, but you know, one kind of year-end planning item that people are going to want to be thinking about uh, is just making sure you're maximizing out, uh, maximizing your 401k contributions at the end of the year or so. Uh, just to attach a dollar figure to that in 2022, you have the ability to uh, put away $20,500 if you're under age 50. If you're 50 and older, you have the ability to uh, contribute an additional $6,500 for a total of $27,000 into uh, your 401k or qualified retirement plan. Uh, I think that's an important piece uh, to be considered every year. I know we're talking about kind of year-end tax planning strategies where you're, you might only have like a paycheck or two left, yeah. but you can definitely pull up your, your most recent pay stub. Um, if you've got some extra wiggle room towards the end of the year, getting those pre-tax dollars in uh, 401k can be important in bringing down your, uh, your, your income for the year, your taxable income. Uh, and then one thing I did want to mention, you know, now that we're at year end, a lot of people have started enrolling in next year's plans for work. Uh, we are seeing a fairly substantial increase in uh, the amount that you can contribute to 401k plans uh, for 2023. Uh, typically, it moves up in, you know, $500 increments, but uh, next year it'll be $22,500 for the baseline contribution. And then if you're 50 and older, the catch-up contribution is moving up to $7,500. So you can sock away uh, $30,000 uh, on an annual basis into a 401k plan. So just something to, to mention to the audience today. So it, it, giving away my age a bit, for a long time, early in my career, the IRA contribution limit was $2,000. 
it wasn't it was, it was just that's just what it was it was two thousand dollars it was this big radical thing when it went up from two thousand dollars so uh there's that and i i was hiding the smile when you mentioned those age 50 catch-up contributions because i finally hit the point where i can uh you know try and take advantage of those now i i qualify well i'm, I'm speaking it's not crazy to say it's you, turning so. 21 but you know it's uh it's right up there <laughs> Yeah, so just those are a couple things. Uh, you know, not necessarily a retirement plan, but another kind of planning opportunity that I thought of that's become pretty popular is just making sure you're maxing out your HSAs if you do have that available to you. So essentially to have an HSA available, you need to be enrolled in a high deductible health plan. Uh, for individuals, you can put away $3,650 into HSAs for this year families can contribute uh, $7,300. So that's an immediate tax deduction as well. One nice thing about the HSA, um, I'm sure some people on this call know, but if you're not aware, that money that you do set aside can be withdrawn in the future for uh, approved medical expenses. There's no taxes uh, that are due on that money. And typically, I've, most custodians now uh, on the HSA front, whoever holds your HSA, usually have the options available to invest those dollars so they can be used as more of kind of a long-term savings vehicle so as you age maybe your medical expenses are increasing at that point you can pull money out of those accounts uh, to you know help lessen the medical expense burden as uh, you get older um, yeah really uh, using as a super tax savings accumulation vehicle tax deduction on the way in invest the dollars in a tax sheltered environment take them out tax free with qualifying medical expenses <clears throat> which as you mentioned you can keep track of those and reimburse yourself down the road so really yeah that. that's yeah that's a great point a uh, couple other things to mention i guess one of the nice things about nhsa there's no income limits or phase out limits you know like you would have with a roth ira um, so high income earners can utilize this uh, strategy and then uh, you do have the ability to contribute into next year. So if you don't have an HSA set up yet for this year, but you are eligible for one, you can still do that uh, through April 18th of 2023. So you do have some time to make those contributions still. Fantastic. All right, very good. Uh, well, let's see. So we, we, we talked as we're pre-gaming this about a few specialty type areas. <laughs> And Kevin and I have done a lot of time uh, working with corporate executives, and this is a uh, busy time of the year for a lot of reasons, but one of them is there's some special elections or special considerations. Kevin, you have anything to share with us in terms of year-end uh, thoughts and planning tips for executives? Boy, yeah, you, know, you, uh, you nailed it. And as long as we've got about four or five hours left on this, we, uh, we should be able to get through half of it. We'll have to check the Zoom license, but that, that might be normal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. This is a hot topic and, and I think, gosh, I might be stealing more of your, uh, your sayings here, but you know, when you start commingling a lot of complexity with personal financial situation and tax planning and executive benefits, so EDCP, SARS, non-qualified stock options, incentive stock options, restricted stock, performance shares, et cetera, et cetera. It, it gets to be uh, something like 3D chess underwater or something along those lines. I, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> yeah. But there, there is a lot of extra complexity. A few of the big ones, though, and, and I think where you were going with this is uh, that executive non-qualified deferred compensation plan, and it is available to uh, those folks above a certain income threshold, and it is, you know, in a sense, uh, designed to be a, an opportunity above and beyond, uh, say, a 401k plan to uh, to defer some of your income, to get that opportunity to have additional pre-tax dollars uh, getting saved. There are uh, a whole host of other considerations, the company you work for, big company, small company, is the company doing well? Are there some challenges? Because every time you sign up for a plan like this, you're making some decisions about how long you might have the money in the plan and then at distribution, how long it's gonna be there. But the, the tax consideration is really, 
if these are your peak earning years, you have a huge opportunity to defer a significant, oftentimes, you know, usually not 100%, but perhaps say 90% of any sort of salary and bonus compensation that you might be due. And so there's a, a huge opportunity to defer your income. Now, the, the planning specifics can have an awful lot to do with uh, if you've got a spouse, uh, do they have significant income or do they not have significant income? Do you have any big expenses coming up? Do you want to plan for an intermediate term sort of expense that you could utilize the plan for? So that, that deferred compensation component is a very powerful tool. It is, again, not a perfect silver lining. Um, there, there are strings attached. But it, uh, it, it does dominate a lot of conversations for our executive clients this time of year, because that is an irrevocable decision that once you make it for full year calendar 2023, you're stuck. Yep. If you defer to a, oh, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say, yeah, making the decision now for next year, how much money you want to say, don't give it to me. And also the decision for how it's going to be paid out well in advance in the future, when you retire, when you separate from service. And it is mentioned in the beginning, seek your own professional advice because there's legal considerations, yeah. tax considerations. Um, you know, the plan dollars are technically subject to substantial risk of forfeiture and a lot of issues there. So thanks, yeah. Yep. Yeah, you know, maybe just a couple other year end considerations in particular with a year like this. And so uh, a, a lot of folks in the executive compensation world do have, uh, you know, either restricted stock units, performance shares, or perhaps uh, stock options. And that can be a non qualified option, it can be an incentive option. Most frequently, that's a non qualified option. But like Mark alluded to earlier, there can be an opportunity to fill up some brackets. And uh, when we may have um, a client that has retired, still has an opportunity to exercise options beyond that retirement date. Uh, well, Mark was talking more about that non-qualified capital gains piece. You could also fill up those low tax brackets with option sales. And so that might not be up to a 0% capital gains rate, but we think about it in the same way is that what is the current tax landscape? What are our brackets? Where is somebody likely to be? How much time do they have to actually exercise those options? And then of course, what's their personal circumstance? Uh, what is the what is the reality of what's going on with that company? Do we still think uh, that you know is, is it a good value right now to to exercise? And so you know we we definitely look at uh, at that component. And then you know maybe one other piece would be a lot of clients this time of year are thinking about their charitable intentions and gifting uh, low basis, so shares that you purchase company stock. Uh, at, at a very low cost, but that have appreciated over the years, there could be a huge opportunity to gift those shares instead of writing the check. And, you know, everybody likes to write the check, but they're, you know, avoiding that capital gain that is embedded in those shares uh, by gifting the company shares is a, is a huge opportunity. Tremendous. We're talking charitable gifting. We're always telling people, whoa, put the checkbook away. Let's talk for a second. Yep. Let's look at your whole balance sheet and think this through. So yeah, I mean, tremendous opportunity for gifting to charity, but also to family, right? I mean, Mark was describing that 0% capital gains bracket. Um, yep. Maybe there's people in the family, lower income, and you could gift those highly appreciated shares have gone up in value and let them uh, sell them at a lower rate. <laughs> yep, yep. We've seen that on a number of occasions where uh, people in the power stroke of their career, they are at their peak earning years in a very high tax bracket, but can gift shares instead of, say, the annual gift exclusion for, for their kids, grandkids, what have you. If, if that's something you want to do, getting rid of those highly appreciated shares can be a great way to do it because oftentimes their, their kids or the beneficiary of that is in a, a much lower tax bracket. Yeah, that's great. Maybe you touch on a few things. You know, we've been doing a series of these types of wealth strategy webinars. Uh, Mark joined us earlier in the year and we talked about um, state residency issues. 
And mm -hmm. there's some wrinkles there that come into play with the deferred compensation plan. If someone's saying they might move to another state, mm -hmm. uh, both some reasons for why they might want to participate and also in the payout election. Yeah. And uh, um, we've also done a, a couple that we've talked specifically about executive compensation with uh, John Nersessi and Wealth Strategist PIMCO. So if anyone's interested, let us know we have those on file. So, well, that's great. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Mark, what about business owners? Any particular uh, techniques? Yeah, I think at top of our radar right now, um, especially for Minnesota residents, small business owners, um, is what came to be last year. Maybe people had heard about it, but the pass-through entity tax rules. Um, as you may know, from a itemizing deduction standpoint, you're capped at $10,000 of taxes, real estate taxes, income taxes that you can deduct. So when we're thinking standard deduction versus itemizing, state like Minnesota, high um, income tax state was really penalized in some ways by having 10,000 be the cap. Um, so a way around that, that the state of Minnesota um, ended up passing was for S corporations or partnerships, a way to pay state income tax at the business level on the behalf of the individual owners or partners. Um, and what that does is it's a, you're paying the tax, it's a deduction, a business deduction on the business level um, filing, and then you get the credit on your personal filing. So as an example, you know, if Scott, you were looking into this and typically paid $10,000 in state taxes um, from really what your business income was. It could be that you make the election to pay it at the business level, you pay the 10,000 there. Let's just say as an example, you're at a 24% bracket, that 24% federal bracket, now you have 10,000 extra deduction that saved you $2,400. So if you don't do it, it's not a, there's no state tax savings, it's all federal. Um, and we're seeing this kind of throughout the country. Minnesota is not the only state that passed something like this. So if you're in other states, definitely talk to advisors of seeing if your state has something similar. Um, so that's probably piece number one of low hanging fruit. That's related to what uh, people are fondly calling the, the salt, right? Salt limitation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The salt limitation that's been in effect for three plus years. State and local tax. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I mean, some people claim and it seems there's some evidence that this has actually prompted quite a few people to consider moving states because of the state tax issue, right? Losing the deductibility. If you're in New York and you had a large deduction for your state income tax, all of a sudden that makes Florida look that much more attractive, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of residency discussions at this point of people trying to figure out, especially the retirees, if they're spending close to six months or more in Florida or Texas, um, Arizona, those types mm -hmm. of more, um, yeah. when you have cold weather, um, like Minnesota, some people like to get away and, and that's come about too because of that salt cap like you mentioned mark i'm just kind of curious are there any discussions around the salt cap happening um any rumblings that you've heard of on your end it it was brought up and what was kind of previously proposed tax legislation that nothing ever did get passed mm -hmm. kind of in the last sessions at the like federal level right this is a federal cap piece right. um so i don't necessarily anticipate anything all of this will sunset um, in years to come, but we're still in a place where we have that cap. And so we're assuming that's gonna remain the same going forward. I mean, if we look, if you're gonna have a still kind of a split Congress, um, it may be tough to pass significant mm -hmm. tax reform at the federal level. Okay, got it. Yeah, I was just curious. And if it's still 70 degrees in January in Florida, mm -hmm. does it matter? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good good point. Um even earlier today we spoke with some clients who are in Georgia, their shorts and t-shirts that is 70 and they're taking their boat out for a last lap before they they winterize it. Like yeah, yeah. we can't speak the same way, I guess, this time of year. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Mark, what what about uh, you know, throw throw some zingers at you? You know, end of the year, you see these ads, these sales. You know, uh, business owner buy a vehicle, buy a big truck or something for the deduction. What about equipment, accelerating expenses, those general types of things for for business owners? Anything yeah. you recommend or have people look at? Talking about saying, hey, let's bring forward expenses or defer billing. Yeah, I think you hit it right there in that last sentence of bring forward expenses. We don't want to necessarily just say like, oh, how else do we spend? We, we always want to lean into start with what is financially, you know, the the thing that aligns with your value. Yeah. And where I, you I've got go. a buddy who's in a family business. He's always like, oh, it's a write-off. It's a write-off. I'm like, whoa, whoa, I'm not sure you know what a write-off means, right? Yeah. It's still costing you money. It's yeah. just you're saving your tax rate on it, yeah. right? Because, on yeah, like in, in that lens, you know, if I spend a thousand dollars, you know, you either spent a thousand dollars and you're out a thousand and you save 25%. So you're, you're out the, you know, $750, or if you didn't spend it at all, you're, you're still better off in a way. But if it's bringing forward expenses, we do see that as a, a way of really you're looking at it it's always just a bet on tax rate this year versus tax rate next or whenever you're looking um yes you could say time value of money but just kind of an overall theme is more like did i earn more this year am i considering purchasing a vehicle or investing in that for the business or even cases where people are saying we were more successful we always want to promote and, and share that with our staff and have some type of informal profit sharing with the staff is that it's better to bonus that out by year end from a business level than it is to necessarily bonus it in January. So just thinking of the timing pieces on items like that. Um, and same with right now, if you have receivables collectible as a business or things, you know, you can send that additional invoice reminder um, now, or you could wait until January. Um, you could always delay that reminder right, piece depending right. on if you think you'll collect. So um, all of those pieces come into play right now. Plus you could, you can increase the interest rate on the bottom of the note. The <laughs> terms, right? <laughs> right. Just like the IRS did. So defer to next year and charge more on the uh, late <laughs> billing. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very good. Maybe a simple, but important one for you, Mark tax deduction versus tax credit. Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. We we get it all the time. Where in the vein um, of the write off, what's the difference? Yeah, so tax deduction, reduction in your income, tax credit is a reduction in the tax. So the key piece here is, you know, is it dollar for dollar, which is a credit, so child tax credit or pieces like that. If it's a two thousand dollar credit, you're saving two thousand dollars in taxes. If it's a two thousand dollar deduction you're saving at your tax rate. So the 2000 is a $500 reduction in tax or whatever your tax rate is. But yeah, a very common question or a piece where people think that it's dollar for dollar when it's not. Right, so tax credit's a lot harder to come by and, and a lot more valuable if you're comparing yep. the actual Absolutely. dollar amount. All right, so maybe another one like that. Difference between uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in in that five, respect, five five to ten isn't that yeah, what it's oh, <laughs> or, it, inflation? It's five to ten now. It used right, to be right, five. Right. <laughs> it's five to ten. Yeah, it's a, a piece where when we're planning, you know, anything we're doing, we're saying like under the scope of the law, like what is allowed and what are we maybe missing out on versus you know what is you know. It, However you cut it, um, you want to just make sure that it's under the law and that you're planning based on like what they're really incentivizing you to take advantage of versus trying to create your own laws, um, which is not where I we're actually just listening to a tax professor and he said that uh, really tax compliance in the United States is very, very high compared to other places in the world. He said it and largely, you know, maybe it's our nature, but also because there's quite a generous allowance for tax planning in the tax code and just being smart about what is allowable uh, avoidance yeah. versus mm -hmm. evasion, just not, not paying the taxes. So yeah. 
Well, very good. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Derek, I know we talked about covering maybe a few items related to gifting. Yeah, yeah, I had um, uh, a few things written down here as well. I think just as a general reminder to, to everyone, you do have an annual gifting exclusion available to you for this year, which is $16,000. Um, so you can gift up to $16,000 this year without any tax ramifications or reporting requirements. So my, my just, last name is spelled O apostrophe capital L A U. G. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No one has checks anymore. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, so just just giving you a quick example of you know how this could be useful within a, a family. Let's say so. Let's say you are married, and uh, you have one adult child who you'd like to give some money to over the holidays. You and your spouse uh, would be able to gift sixteen thousand dollars each to that child for a total of 32,000. And then let's say that that adult child is married, uh, you could do the same for their spouse as well. And that would come again without any tax ramifications or uh, reporting requirements. So um, that's a nice piece. And then tying that back into something that Kevin alluded to earlier, you know, you could look at uh, gifting appreciated securities uh, to said adult child, um, you know, maybe they're in a lower tax bracket. Uh, that's where this strategy could come in uh, play and be a little bit useful. You were going to make the gift anyways, but by removing those capital gains out of your portfolio uh, could save some money on, on taxes. So uh, that's one thing. Another thing we're looking at with clients right now is uh, donor advised funds. And this strategy is really ideal for people that are uh, close to uh, the standard deduction, maybe with their itemized deductions, or for people who uh, are making regular donations to charities or plan to donate in the future. So basically the donor advised fund gets set up with a financial institution that has maybe a charitable institution attached to it uh, for the purpose of managing those donor advised funds. The, uh, the taxpayer donor provides assets into that donor advised fund and then can advise as to where and when those disbursements go out to the particular charities uh, that are either available through the donor advised fund um, and some are a little bit more broad based where you can kind of donate uh, at your at your will or leisure. So uh, this uh, strategy really effectively gives the donor a, a tax benefit today by receiving the upfront tax deduction for the fair market value of the assets that they put into the donor advice fund for the year that the contribution was made. So, you know, we talk uh, along with the strategy, we talk kind of about bunching contributions. So this just came up actually uh, in planning with a client recently where they are very charitably inclined. They, they like giving, uh, they were pretty close to the, uh, to being able to itemize deductions for this tax year. Well, we decided to <clears throat> donate some uh, appreciated securities into their donor advised fund uh, for a few years worth of donations to increase their uh, deductions uh, for this year. So just something to keep in mind uh, for people that I guess that are charitably inclined or again, like I said, really close to being able to itemize deductions. It's a really good strategy to help yeah and, and that, that one I, I can't resist I like to view the donor advised fund as almost like a, a time machine and you know Kevin was telling the executives or if we have business owners sometimes people are in the peak earning years at the end of their career maybe they have assets that have gone way up in value it's a way of bunching as you described Derek to take advantage of getting over the standard deduction yep. and get the benefit of that charitable income tax deduction against some of their highest earning years and then the money can sit in the donor advice fund and be trickled out over time. So really fantastic tool. We love them. We use them all the time, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, great clarification there, Scott. And then, you know, another gifting strategy that we're looking at with clients is qualified charitable contributions or QCDs. So again, throwing more acronyms at everyone. Um, this strategy is, is ideal for people that are at RMD age. Uh, that maybe don't need their RMDs to uh, to live essentially, and they're very charitably inclined. So essentially, what this does or what this allows is that the RMDs from your IRAs are able to be sent directly to uh, charities. So 
a few things to keep in mind, I guess, with this strategy. And Mark, you can correct me if I'm a little off on the, the details here, but um, I don't believe that gifts to private foundations uh, work nor donor advised funds. So they have to go directly to the charities uh, that are eligible. And uh, one kind of thing that I found uh, interesting as I was kind of doing some research for this particular topic, um, the charities cannot send anything back to the donor. Uh, otherwise, it nullifies and disqualifies the QCD tax treatment, which I thought was pretty interesting. So if they send you a little like, I don't know, thank you Christmas tree in the mail or something like little thing for your uh, or an ornament, maybe just send it back to them. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point there. Yeah, like, so no going to uh, charitable silent auctions and bidding your qualified charitable distributions on the silent auctions, I guess. <laughs> there, yeah. there you go. Mark, maybe maybe one other question I've heard that, uh, I mean, the, the QCD, the qualified charitable distribution is relatively new. It was, it was its future was uncertain and it was extended, but the reporting of it, uh, it's it's not real clear, right? And this is an easy thing for people to miss on their tax return. Yeah. It can look like just a regular taxable distribution. Do you have any thoughts for us on that in terms yeah, of yeah. tracking so, that or noting that? Um, you're right. You know, the brokerage firm or whoever is the in the financial institution that you hold your IRA at, they're not going to report it on the tax document that oh, I took 10,000 out and it all went to charity, so zero is taxable. Just make sure you're telling, if you have someone who prepares your tax return, you need to specifically tell them it came from the IRA. Otherwise, it's very easy for someone to just report it as they see it on the document, which it will say that it's all taxable. It really comes when you file your tax return that you're reporting it as such as a deduction or a, that it's not considered taxable income. Great. Uh, let's see. I want, I want to go back on a couple couple things and ask the the brain trust here. Um, Kevin, you were talking earlier about tax loss sales, taking the opportunity to reposition the portfolio. Maybe this is a bit of a silver lining. You know, we've put a quite a bit of thought about okay, when you're doing that, or someone comes in and we're repositioning the portfolio, what are the ideal vehicles to have those dollars be reinvested in? I am. Um, I guess I'm kind of teeing you up for thing on what maybe some of the downfalls of mutual funds versus some of the other structures we're looking at. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if we exclude ostrich eggs and pull tabs, uh, then yes, there's, <laughs> they're better. One of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> Meat raffle tickets. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Yeah. That's a good one too. Uh, so, you know, I think rewind the clock a couple decades when, when both of us had gotten started in the, uh, the profession, you know, mutual funds were that uh, that wrapper, that investment wrapper that provided some diversification, and some of them were quite specific. Some of them were broad based. That gave way uh, a few years down the path, maybe say mid two thousands, to a real flow towards exchange traded funds. That that ETF, so more acronyms, but a mutual fund versus an exchange traded fund are effectively the same, a pooled investment, but the composition and how they're created and the tax ramifications are, are quite different. And so it is a bit of a rabbit hole, but the bottom line is the mutual fund is a pass-through entity. And so as there are gains or losses inside that fund, you know, those gains need to be distributed. There is a creation and redemption uh, component to an exchange-traded fund where uh, they are much more tax efficient. And so, uh, you know, without going, get, getting too specific, there are uh, a number of the firms that we work with have actually been moving that direction. So the opportunities to, yep. um, to, to leverage that ETF wrapper have, have become much more frequent. And, and that does dominate a, a big chunk of the, the portfolio recommendations. Yeah, and, and something else, thank you, that you know we're, we're looking at and uh, I think we're thinking could really work in certain situations, maybe not all uh, investor cases, but this idea of direct indexing or mm. what's really separately managed accounts. I mean, how does that work and why might that be a benefit tax-wise? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it is, 
you know, again, rewind the clock, separately account or separate uh, managed, separately managed accounts have been around for a long time. Um, my first experiences with them were that it was a lot of stock pickers. It was uh, very high costs. It was in effect the, uh, the industry's way of increasing revenue while calling something a, a new fancy name. And there were, there were several downsides with that. And so had, had shied away for quite some time. Now, fast forward to today and, and the last few years, direct indexing, indexing low cost, broad-based. We're big fans of that. And as a default option, it's a, a great way to invest. But the direct indexing is instead of owning a product or a, uh, an ETF, a mutual fund that represents an index, you actually, as the investor, own the index, all of those individual companies. So we'll just use the S&P 500 as an example. Instead of owning one line item that, say, Vanguard S&P 500, you own those 500 companies in proportion to that index. The benefit there is, well, cost, it can be quite low cost, but um, the that tax loss or gain harvesting component is that, you know, you, uh, you have the companies in that index going up and down every single day, the ability to harvest losses as you go to uh, to minimize the tax drag on your portfolio can be a, a huge advantage. And then the, the other piece that we've touched on a couple of times, that charitable giving piece, uh, being able to designate perhaps a, one of those companies, you know, without naming names, we've had some high flyers and there always is. Uh, but, but to be able to pair off perhaps one of those companies that, that hit the headlines and has been a, a high flyer for your charitable intent, well, you're now, you're now uh, eliminating what would have been a gain you had to realize. It's gone to charity and that portfolio can rebalance itself. So interesting things that have-, uh, have Yeah, presented and I mean, even in good years, even in a run of good years, there'll be a number of stocks in that index that are down. So the flip side of what you're saying, and maybe someone says, I, I need some cash, we're gonna take a trip, we wanna buy a car or whatever. You really go and specifically sell things at a loss in a good year, as opposed to having to sell the whole basket at a gain is pretty interesting. Yep, yep, interesting opportunities for sure. Yeah, and I mean, we spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff, right? We try and do a good job on investment performance, investment selection, asset allocation. But I think we know, one of the biggest areas we have is the tax planning around the portfolio. Uh, we've talked before, we did a webinar with, with Vanguard, so I want Vanguard's advisor alpha study. Yeah. And really one of the biggest components, one a, a huge area that we're able to deliver positive net returns is through tax planning around the structure of the, the investments, where they're located, like you talked about the different types of holdings and that tax management, all the things uh, you've been hitting on. Good, good. Well, hey, there's there's one big one that uh, we haven't spent much time on, but gets a lot of discussion, and rightly so, especially in a year like this. What do you all think about, or how do you think about uh, Roth IRA conversions? Yeah, I'll start since it was under my uh, IRA umbrella. Then you guys can certainly certainly charm in. Uh, we're we're certainly talking to clients about it uh, quite a bit. Roth conversions. Um, typically, the strategy is uh, really nice for taxpayers uh, with lower income, kind of relative to the rest of their lives. Um, as an easy example, maybe you and your your spouse uh, were high income earners. You took early retirement from you know the companies that you were working for. Maybe you're not working, or maybe you're working kind of part time jobs to just kind of fill your time and, and feel fulfilled. Um, these are kind of the opportunities, uh, and I guess uh, this is the typical, I guess, I idea as to where we might want to look at implementing a Roth conversion. And essentially, making it simple, you're taking uh, money from traditional retirement accounts and moving them over to Roth accounts and paying taxes uh, on those conversions. So if you're in kind of a, a nice lower income uh, window of your life, you know, this this strategy can be particularly uh, lucrative 
and uh, well worth your time. I mean, there's obviously a ton of advantages to the Roth accounts. You know, you're not uh, subject to taxes when you withdraw from those uh, accounts down the road, and they're not subject to R&D requirements uh, either. So it's a uh, it's a really nice strategy to consider for uh, the right you know type of clients, and you can really look at filling up those kind of smaller uh, federal tax brackets, the 10, the 12, and you know possibly look at either the 22 or 24 percent tax bracket for those conversions. Yeah, so paying tax voluntarily, ideally at a low rate or at assets that have fallen in value. So then you're paying that tax to do the conversion and it's Roth IRA status. The idea that hopefully it's gonna rebound in value you know, from a down year like this and that you may be in a higher tax rate later. So there might really be a, a double whammy with kind of that, that jack in the box effect of uh, doing a Roth conversion right now. Uh, Mark, how do you think about that? Anything to add? No, I think everyone always brings up the Roth conversion, um, and I think it's a great planning item. I think for a lot of people, the first place to look is, can I contribute to a Roth IRA first rather than convert? Um, because if you have the ability to contribute to a Roth IRA, that's not adding additional taxable dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that first, your Roth 401k, if you have that option, but then Roth conversion. And the big question becomes, well, how am I going to pay the tax, right? Usually when you convert, right, we don't want withholding on that. We want to shift the dollars directly there. So you typically are looking to say, do I have a taxable investment account? Do I have savings to really pay the tax? Um, you know, we don't want to be younger than 59 and a half and have that conversion, have no other dollars to pay it and then take a early distribution from our retirement account to pay the taxes. Now we're causing more harm than good. So you just have to be talking with your, you know, financial planners to figure out, you know, this is something that's brought up by my tax advisor. Do I have the assets and the cash flow to do this effectively and take advantage of the low rates? Yeah, that, that's great. You know, as much as I love Roth conversions when they work, I'm maybe a bit of an odd duck in the industry that I think they're a bit oversold or maybe a lot mm -hmm. oversold. And I think for a lot of people, especially when they're accumulating, uh, if you are higher income, the ability to have dollar for dollar, every dollar working for you and building your assets can be really valuable because the future is uncertain. We don't know. We don't know about future returns. We don't know about future tax rates. And um, I know uh, the idea of tax-free sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like it puts a smile on everyone's face, right? But uh, to voluntarily say, okay, I'm going to write this check on a conversion, and you know that money's gone. It's off your balance sheet. It is gone, just with the hope that you'll be in a better position in the future because of it. Versus leaving those dollars at play, I think is yeah, uh, it, it's it's a interesting very one. carefully. Yeah, Scott, because you know. There's people who are fans, there's people who are against, same thing in real estate, people who are for, right, people who are right. against. Yeah. When it comes to Roth conversion, the numbers, all it says is, it's just a bet on tax rate today versus tax rate tomorrow. Yes. People always think that, oh, I'm getting tax-free growth in my portfolio. Well, you technically lost, like how the calculation, all it works is, am I at 32% now and 37% down the road? You're just yeah. Looking at that, there's no other piece really to the calculation other than a tax rate bet. It, it, it can be a great play, but, you know, Kevin and I are telling old time stories. Well, th there's a fellow out there who's made a career out of talking about the tax bomb that's coming down the road and how it's going to be so bad. He's still doing it 30 years later. And, <laughs> right. you, you know, I look at him like his advice technically would have been wrong, 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 maybe right, right for a couple of years, wrong, right, wrong, right, but not a tremendous win by any means. You know, in many cases, people would have been better off saying, I'm not going to prepay on a conversion. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the effective rate has been about the same or less for much mm -hmm. of that time. Definitely. You know, to, to chime in quick on that, I, you know, my, my first thought obviously is uh, I, I might need to duck as we present prepaying taxes, you know, let's bring taxes forward. Somebody's going to throw a, a pen at me from across the conference table, but, but there, there can be a time and a place for that. And, and Scott, you know, a, a lot of the clients where we've seen an opportunity, um, 
that might be multi-generational wealth. So the, the mm -hmm. tax calculation for their life, for uh, you know what their retirement might look like, higher tax bracket, lower tax bracket, a, a lot of that. And what we take into consideration is as we look forward, the next generation, if they've got children that are, you know, they're not going to spend all these dollars. They uh, have kids that are high income earners. You know, maybe there's an opportunity to eat some of the tax, even at a higher rate, but not maybe 37 percent. Uh, and, and so, you know, we it, another reason why that that big holistic multi generational planning picture is so critical. Well, and, and it reaches a point there, right, where some of our folks have a large enough estate where they're looking at the the, the likelihood of federal estate taxes taking a huge bite out of their estate. Yeah. If you're well over that limit, you say, okay, I'm going to pay a high rate to do this conversion. But the way it works is you pay those in those income tax dollars are removed from the taxable estate. So we have different tax regimes. We're kind of thinking, mm -hmm. thinking through here, but the Roth conversion can help the heirs and reduce the taxable estate. So kind of interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, we, we have just a couple minutes left. And one of the things I'm very excited about evolution in the business is the new tax planning software we've been using the last couple of years. Um, Derek, Kevin, you want to talk a little bit about Holista Plan and how we're using that, incorporating client meetings and the power? Or, or you, I see you nodding your head, Mark. Are you familiar with this as well? Are you using it? Or? From familiar with the software. We don't use it um, yeah. internally, but I know it's kind of the cutting edge of the planning area. So mm -hmm. it's very neat you're using it. Yeah. What's interesting, Scott, is I was I was just pinging with their uh, support team yesterday on this, uh, not knowing this question was going to come up to me. But <laughs> I found out officially, and this is, we'll have to big deal us at a, a, a conference. We can lord it over. Big deal in it right now. We're big dealing right now. We'll lord it over our, our colleagues and friends. But uh, but we were uh, we were actually number one hundred ninety one out of what are now forty five hundred users. And so you gotta get some hats or something. We're one ninety one. Yeah. Right? Yep. Very, very early in the beta. And so the, the real high level is this gives us an opportunity to uh, to do some projections to uh, model out some of the scenarios that we're talking about here. Whether that would be qualified charitable distributions, whether that. <clears throat> Or advised fund contributions, whether that's should we be doing a Roth contribution versus a you know pre-tax 401k, et cetera, et cetera. And so it uh, in short is uh, it's a really powerful tool and a great add-on as as we try to wrap our brains around the the piece that you know Mark knows forwards, backwards, and inside and out. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I hit the limits of my tech uh, speak quickly, but I mean, it, it actually is using some smart programming or artificial intelligence, isn't it? Scanning, yep. determining, and, and suggesting and walking through uh, a lot of different strategies. So, very cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's super interesting, and like it, it just points to that like the complicated nature of it. You know, we know the tax tables. You yep. look at something like Holista Plan or any software, and you start to bring forward. There's Medicare premium brackets for those that are hitting those, and that's not necessarily told by the story of your tax bracket, yet it, all of that comes into play. And if you have a financial planning team that can really look at that and say, okay, we may want to avoid that extra $2,000 of income this year based on this or that, um, it's really resourceful. So That's great. That's great. Uh, a thought came to mind as Derek was talking about charitable contributions. We have a whole one of these sessions that we did fairly recently with uh, Dr. Russell James, who's regarded as one of the nation's top experts in philanthropy and charitable giving. Mm -hmm. So anyone watching, listening, interested in hearing more about those strategies, I highly recommend that one. It was, it was great that we we're able to get him on. And along those lines, thanks for coming together, guys. Thank you, Mark, our special guest. Really appreciate it. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for carrying me as I've been fighting back this uh, this <laughs> this chest thing. So I really appreciate you guys carrying the load on this. But uh, a lot of fun. Uh, people listening will have a recording available. Thanks for uh, joining us. And uh, seek your own advice, uh, your own experts, and feel free to uh, you know call Mark or us at the office. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks everybody.